when radium was discovered in 1898, it seemed a lot like a miracle. The new element was found by scientist and future Nobel Prize winner Marie Curie and her husband Pierre. The breakthrough was revolutionary. Curie herself was in awe of the element. She often referred to the substance as beautiful radium. Beautiful as it seemed. However, the discovery was also dangerous. Few knew the harm radium could cause. 20 or so years later, hundreds of women in the U.S. would work closely with the element, unaware that it was slowly devouring them from the inside out. This is the story of the Radium Girls. Not long after Curie's discovery, American inventor William J. Hammer traveled to Paris where he obtained a small amount of radium salt crystals from the couple. He found that by mixing it with glue and zinc sulfide, he could produce a glow-in-the-dark paint, which became wildly popular. The U.S. Radium Corporation bought Hammer's invention, using it to manufacture wristwatches with dials that glowed in the dark. Not only did the wristwatches become a wildly popular fashion accessory, U.S. Radium also received government contracts at the start of World War I to produce glowing watches and airplane instruments for U.S. soldiers. The corporation set up factories in New Jersey and recruited young women to work in their factories to paint the clock dials. U.S. Radium Corps was one of the leading users of the substance, although other companies opened factories around the U.S. and Canada, and soon, hundreds of women were hired as dial painters. Women and teenage girls were recruited for the job due to their smaller and nimble hands being ideal for the detailed work of painting wristwatch dials. The occupation was popular among American and Canadian women beginning around 1916. The job was artistic and well-paid compared to the other jobs for women at the time, with employees earning up to three times the amount they'd be paid at other factories. Women were also given a sense of usefulness in the war efforts, as many of the products were produced for military use. The job was referred to as the elite job for the poor working girls at the time and allowed women to find financial freedom. But despite their newfound independence, these women and girls would soon find themselves bound to one particularly sinister and noxious master, that beautiful, lurid radium. The element was marketed as a sort of marvelous cure-all for disease, illness, old age, and ugliness. Some salesmen promoted radium as a substance which could extend people's lives, boost sex drives, and make women more beautiful. Folks drank radium water as a tonic, wore radium cosmetics, and products such as butter, milk, and toothpaste laced with small amounts of radium were all common at the time. After it was discovered that radium could treat cancer, many mistakenly believed that it could also be used to treat other conditions. It was promptly sold in pharmacies to treat all kinds of ailments. Ads purported that radium was magic. News reports claimed that it could even add years to our lives. These beliefs were largely promoted by radium firms such as U.S. Radium, which had built profitable and lucrative businesses riding on this idea. Shamefully, these companies were also slowly, neglectfully poisoning their employees with the very element they promoted as magical. Researchers for these firms largely ignored any signs of danger from the element. Managers reportedly told the women working in their factories that radium would put roses in their cheeks. Because the dials they would paint were so small, workers were instructed to use a technique called the lip dip or lip pointing. This involved workers slipping their paintbrush between their lips to make a fine point between each of the numbers they painted. Employees would paint up to 200 watches per day ingesting a small amount of radium with every number they painted. One U.S. radium employee, Mae Cubberly, who worked at the Orange, New Jersey factory, 
later remembered. The first thing we asked was, does this stuff hurt you? Naturally, you don't want to put anything in your mouth that's going to hurt you. The manager said that it wasn't dangerous and that we didn't need to be afraid. As more and more women labored in the factories, they would become referred to as the ghost girls. By the time they would finish their shifts, the women themselves would glow in the dark due to the luminosity of radium, which was also part of the allure of the job. Many women would wear their nicest dresses to work and take advantage of the trendy glow of radium, painting it onto their outfits, nails, or teeth. Cecil Drinker, a Harvard physiologist who later investigated the factories, reported that their hair, faces, hands, arms, necks, the dresses, the underclothes, even the corsets of the dial painters were luminous. One of the girls showed luminous spots on her legs and thighs. The back of another was luminous almost to the waist. They would glow like phantoms on their walks home after work, oblivious to their bodies slowly deteriorating from the very thing that made them glimmer. Since its discovery, even Marie Curie knew about radium's ability to cause harm. Curie herself suffered from radiation burns as a result of handling the element, and her husband noted that he would not want to be in a room with a kilo worth of pure radium in it, believing that it could burn the skin off his body, destroy his eyesight, and probably kill him. People had already died of radium poisoning well before any of the watch factories were up and running. Scientists knew of the hazardous effects of the substance, but companies like U.S. Radium Corps insisted the benefits outweighed the risks. Factories would even supply their male employees with lead aprons and ivory-tipped tongs while working with radium in labs. But sadly, women working at these factories were not provided the same protections and were told that they were not in danger. According to Kate Moore, author of the book, Radium Girls, manufacturers funded research that supported their claims and ignored independent studies that proved the opposite. The female factory workers began experiencing horrific and harmful symptoms. And by the mid-1920s, dozens of women who worked in the factories began showing signs of illness. The ingested radium had started eating away at the workers' bones, emitting a constant and destructive radiation. One of the first radium girls to experience physical damage by the radiation was Amelia Molly Maggia, who worked at the U.S. Radium Factory in New Jersey. After experiencing a toothache, Maggia went to have the tooth removed. Soon after, a neighboring tooth had to be extracted which led to painful, bleeding ulcers that would fill with pus in place of the teeth. The illness spread throughout the rest of Magia's mouth and other parts of her body, causing her aches and pains, eventually leaving her unable to walk. The doctor dismissed her pain as rheumatism and prescribed her aspirin. By May 1922, her entire lower jaw, the roof of her mouth, and a portion of her ear bones were said to be one large abscess. At this point, when a dentist gently prodded her jawbone inside her mouth, the jaw broke against his fingers. Her jaw was then removed by the dentist, not by an operation, but merely by putting his fingers inside her mouth and lifting it out. The rest of her lower jawbone was removed the same way just days later, and four months after, Maja died at the age of 24 due to a massive hemorrhage on September 12, 1922. At this point, no one had linked Maja's illness with her work at U.S. Radium. In fact, as doctors could not determine the cause of her death, they recorded it as syphilis, an inaccuracy later used against her case in court. Magia would not be the only radium girl to experience such a gruesome death. By 1927, more than 50 women who had worked in the factories had died. In the meantime, 
these employees would suffer from the nightmarish consequences of radium poisoning, experiencing terrible symptoms, including bones breaking, teeth falling out, and their spines collapsing. Many women's legs shortened and spontaneously fractured. Some developed enormous sarcomas, or cancerous bone tumors, which grew anywhere on their bodies. Their bones also began emitting light, causing the women to glow from the inside. After Maja's death in 1922, and following the deadly illnesses of other radium girls, their employer continued to dismiss any connection between the deaths and the women's jobs. For two years after Maja's death, U.S. Radium considered the whole ordeal gossip from their employees, which wouldn't go away and led to a downturn in business. After the death of a male employee in 1925, pathologist Dr. Harrison Martlin was hired to investigate the link between deaths and the dial painting occupation. Martlin discovered that the radium had deposited in the women's bones and proved that the radium was responsible for poisoning the factory workers, albeit too late for many. Martlin's studies showed that the ingested radium would settle in the employees' bodies and emit radiation, which would honeycomb their bones, boring holes inside of their bodies while they were still alive. Without a shadow of a doubt, radium was causing the deaths of dozens of innocent laborers. This enraged the president of U.S. Radium, who denied the findings of the study and even commissioned new studies which published the opposite conclusion. Additionally, he lied about the original study's findings to the Department of Labor, which at that point had begun investigating the firm and their increasingly ill employees. U.S. Radium's president publicly denounced the employees as trying to palm off their maladies on the firm, claiming that the women were simply attempting to gain financial assistance for their medical bills. The prosperous radium industry was adamant about discrediting any connection between the work and the illnesses of these women, and workers were forced to band together to fight against the injustices brought upon them. At the time, dial painters were still being hired all over the country, and women were continuing to be exposed to the dangerous work. One driving force in the fight against U.S. radium was a New Jersey woman named Grace Fryer, who commented that, it's not for myself I care. I'm thinking more of the hundreds of girls to whom this may serve as an example. Fryer herself had suffered a crushed spine due to radium poisoning, which forced her to wear a steel back brace. Searching for a lawyer, Fryer was turned down by several attorneys who either didn't believe in the claims, were worried about fighting a powerful corporation, or were not prepared for a legal battle which dealt with overturning existing legislation. The case was also complicated by the statute of limitations at the time, which ruled that victims of occupational poisoning only had two years to present their cases. Often, the effects of radium could take up to five years to appear. Finally, in 1927, attorney Raymond Berry took on the case, and five women, including Grace Fryer, became the center of the fight against U.S. radium. The New Jersey case became front page news all across the country, reaching women facing similar situations with companies in other states. Tragically, by the time Fryer and the rest of the radium girls' case hit the courts, the women were given a prognosis of only four months to live due to their poisoning. With the help of Barry, they filed a lawsuit for damages of $250,000, though eventually settled out of court for $10,000 each and a $600 annual payment. None of these women survived longer than two years following the settlement, but their legal action helped raise awareness about the effects of radium poisoning, a goal of Friars which inspired workers everywhere to fight for justice.
As the news reached Illinois, female workers there became concerned about their work conditions and the connection between their occupation and the illness. According to one worker, Catherine Wolf, there were meetings at our plant that bordered on riots. The chill of fear was so depressing that we could scarcely work. The firm they worked for, Radium Dial, acted similarly as U.S. Radium did in New Jersey. Denying responsibility, Radium Dial lied about the results of their company's medical tests, which proved that their employees were showing undeniable symptoms of radium poisoning. The measures Radium Dial took to hide the evidence were astounding. Company officials went as far as to interfere with their employees' autopsies, stealing their radium-afflicted bones in an attempt to cover up the truth. The women in Illinois started fighting for their case in the mid-1930s, at the peak of the Great Depression. Many shunned the women for suing one of the remaining firms of the state. By this time, Catherine Wolfe, Donahue, after marriage, had developed a grapefruit-sized tumor on her hip, on top of losing her teeth, while also picking out pieces of her jawbone from her mouth. She had witnessed several of her friends' deaths, stealing her up for the legal battle ahead of her. Her case went to court in 1938. After collapsing at an earlier court hearing, Donahue was forced to give her evidence on her deathbed. She was represented by lawyer Leonard Grossman, who worked pro bono, and the case won after Donahue's evidence, as well as other testimonies, before the Illinois Industrial Commission. The Radium Dial Company filed multiple appeals, and Donahue lived long enough to hear that the first appeal before the commission was unanimously denied. She died on July 27, 1938, a day after the company's second appeal was filed. The U.S. Supreme Court declined to hear the company's final appeal and upheld the lower court's ruling. Finally, some justice had been gained for the Radium Girls. As the Second World War approached, women from the clock factories who were still alive more or less became test subjects for researching the repercussions of radium exposure. According to the U.S. Atomic Bomb Commission, if it hadn't been for those dial painters, thousands of workers might well have been, and might still be, in great danger. The production of radium watches continued until 1968, though safety regulations were vastly improved thanks to the New Jersey and Illinois cases. The legacy of those women's work and fight led to new safety standards being introduced in the workplace to protect future dial painters and employees working with plutonium while making atomic bombs. The case was one of the first in the country wherein an employer was made responsible for the health of the company's employees. And in 1949, U.S. Congress passed a law which granted workers rights to compensation for occupational illnesses. Additionally, the case of the Radium Girls ultimately led to the establishment of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, which today operates nationally throughout the U.S. Before OSHA, 14,000 people died at work each year. Now, it's just over 4,500. In the first half of the 20th century, droves of innocent girls and women lost their lives and suffered nightmarish ailments because of poor employment practices, a general dismissal of female workers, and corporate politics. In 2014, one of the last living radium girls, May Keene, died at age 107. Hired at a Waterbury, Connecticut factory in 1924, Keene disliked the gritty taste of radium and refused to put the brush in her mouth while working. She was asked to leave as she was clearly not enjoying the job, and she readily agreed. She later recalled, I often wish I had met my boss after to thank him because I would have been like the rest of them. Likely due to her early resignation, Keene was able to live a long life. 
but many other painters were not so lucky. The story of the Radium Girl should not only serve as a historical anecdote about the rise of workers' rights, but also as a cautionary tale for societies and corporations that value money over human lives. In the case of U.S. Radium Corps and dozens of firms like it, women were disposable if there was money to be made. In response, these women paved the way for improved labor standards, and thanks to their resilience and vehement call for justice, the Radium Girls changed the way that workers would be treated for generations to come.